Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. Tonight, we have another top performer interview. And joining us is Alan, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Allison McCracken with Sotheby's. And Allison, you want to give the group just a brief introduction to yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Alice McCracken. I've been with Sotheby's my entire residential career. I've um, been in residential for the past eight and a half years. I was in commercial before that abroad in uh, Asia and Mexico. I'm native LA, mother of one and a bonus child, um, live in Bel Air, and my office is headquartered in Beverly Hills. I run a little team um, that we're all certified senior real estate specialists. So we really focus on the 55 and over population. All right. And you have a very interesting tagline, so to speak, which is what? We specialize in downsizing, death, and demolition. Downsizing, death, and demolition. Expand on that a little bit. So with our focus um, as senior real estate specialists, um, our target market is over the age of 55. And that breaks into people needing to downsize, people who are dealing with their parents who have passed away or people who have just passed away and we're dealing with trust and estate planning attorneys. And then once those people who have passed away have left their homes, they're typically in a state that developers come along and want to level them and build. Um, so that's one of the aspects of our de um, demolition component, but also we help people modify their homes that want to age in place and help developers design smart homes so people can age in place, but buy a brand new home and, um, you know, choose wisely in their process of thinking of aging in place and being in one place long term. And how did you decide to focus on that slice of the market? There were two um, reasons that we decided, or I decided to focus on that uh, aspect of the market. Number one, I have a passion for helping senior citizens. I actually have a nonprofit that helps seniors stay in their homes as they age. Um, so some people are passionate about puppies and saving animals. Some people are passionate about inner city kids. Um, my true charity work is with seniors. And so that felt very natural to, for me to focus on that demographic, as well as when I looked at the statistics entering into this wild roller coaster of residential real estate and a commission based um, salary lifestyle. Um, the statistics show that the majority of sellers in California are over the age of 55. I knew I wanted to be a listing agent, so it just seemed logical to pursue um, the population that was the majority of sellers and specialize in them. What I, what I find fascinating about you is the way you think about things. And so this is a big, broad question. When you think about real estate and you think about your, you know, how you're going to approach this business, Share with the group your, your thought process in terms of what you're looking to do on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, long term. You know, how, how do you view the business? So there are two things coming into this. Um, and I'm sure all of us have know this and ex have experienced this. Um, it's, it's all about the relationships in life, no matter if it's your relationship at home with your spouse or your children or your workplace, um, it all boils down to having good relationships. And so the way I view real estate is I don't necessarily look at the home as the real estate. I look at my business as a real estate or a relationship business. Um, I have a sixth sense when it comes to real estate. I always have. When I was a kid, I'd drive by an empty corner and I'd say, you know what would be really good there is the McDonald's. And then three years later, McDonald's would be there. So the actual nuts and bolts of selling real estate or knowing where good real estate is, that's just always been a part of who I am. But the way to a successful business really is the having good relationships. Um, so I look at my business as building those relationships. Typically, it takes um, a long time, a lot of tea and coffee, 
um, and a lot of face to face to build those relationships, especially with our demographic that we focus on. Um, and that's okay. A lot of our clients, we've been cultivating those relationships for years before it actually transitions into a sale. And then the second piece of my business model that I look at and the way I see real estate is we are about to approach probably the largest shift of home sales over the next two to three decades that we've ever seen in history because all of our baby boomers are going to be moving on, passing on, um, shifting to their children, buying houses for their children. So I kind of want to be a disruptor in this space of focusing on this demographic because it's such a lucrative demographic. So I speak to the group every day about chasing and you know, breaking that habit, breaking that addiction of chasing after a deal. And you mentioned a big part of what you do is building relationship. Have you ever chased after business? Do you know what I'm referring to? Your, you know, your thoughts around building versus chasing. So in the early stages of my career, I always had like a, a business plan that I was like going to try something new every year. And one year it was door knocking and, and I hate door knocking. <laughs> I just absolutely abhor it. So it's just not my forte. So I don't do it, but I did try it. And that felt very much like chasing to me. Um, maybe I wasn't doing it the right way that I know Steve, you teach a good platform. Um, but that felt like chasing to me. It was very um, non-personal, not authentic. Um, so it, it just didn't sit well with me. And so if it doesn't sit well with me, it's just not the right fit. So the way we really, what feels good is, you know, just being genuine with our neighbors, our community. Um, so one example, when COVID hit, I have, um, there was an elderly gentleman that I had met through the chamber of commerce in Beverly Hills. And he called me up and he was, had been isolated in his home for, um, over a month. And he's like, come drive to my driveway. He has a huge driveway. <laughs> he's a very wealthy man with a big house. Come drive to my driveway, bring the Danish, I'll make the coffee. And we're gonna point our cars at each other like this. And we're gonna get on our cell phones in our cars and we're gonna have coffee in Danish and have a morning conversation. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the whole wide world. And literally a year of, for six months cars pointed at each other in his driveway on the cell phone granted we could have been on our cell phones in our individual houses but there was something about that particular experience that brought us closer together and now i'm listing his eight million dollar 18 million dollar home um it was never the goal for me to get his business it was always the goal to build that relationship with someone that i wanted to build a relationship with because he was a nice man to talk to um so the, the selling of the house is never the end game. I guess it's just being a good neighbor in many regards. And do you feel the pressure on a daily basis of having to do a deal? Or is that not something that's, you know, factors into what you're doing every day? When I first started um, in this business, absolutely. Um, I'm kind of one of those rags to riches success stories where when I first got into um, uh, real estate, I, I was living deal to deal. I was renting a room for $500 uh, a month um, and didn't have a family, didn't have a spouse, none of that stuff. And then uh, fast forward eight and a half years and I own my own home. Um, I don't chase deals and I don't have to worry about where the next deal is coming from at this point. But when I did, I did always know that no matter what, like the next deal would come, you know, as long as I kept doing what I knew was working and I was being true to myself, then it, it would come because I knew I was good at what I, I do. And so having that faith for me was pretty easy. It might be uncomfortable at times and it might take extra effort to remember that, but I've always known that I've always been taken care of no matter what the circumstances are. So if, if you look back over your career, how and why are people doing business with you? How, you know, why, why are they coming to you? What, what happened in the beginning to compel them to do business with you 
And what do you think your real value is, you know, to someone who hires you? So I'm basically referral based. We don't do a lot of marketing. Um, we, we were just kind of our, our clients refer us um, over and over again because they feel they feel safe, number one, because they feel like they're dealing with an expert who understands what they need and how they're going to get reach their goals. And that confidence that we bring into the room is something that is cultivated over years of doing this. Um, but also in the beginning, it was um, the compassion of understanding the people's situation and knowing that yes, we're selling a house, but why are we selling this house? What are the problems that they're facing? What are the solutions we can provide? And truly listening, most people you know, go in and they've got their agenda and they know exactly what they're gonna do, but then listening to what was important about the house. You know, We have a questionnaire. One of the best questions we ask that people really feel valued is what's your favorite part about your house? You have lived in this house for the past 20, 30, 40 years, you know this house better than anybody, better than I do. So tell me what are your favorite parts about this home? Is it the sun when it trickles through at eight o'clock in the morning while you're having your coffee at the table from this window? Is it when you look out from here? And so I think that that compassion um, has gone a long, long way. And as well as our expertise in providing solutions that are outside of the box. So for example, it would be providing people with referral base referrals to in-home care providers or assisted living placement specialists, um, senior downsizing specialists, move managers, you know, financial advisors, estate planning attorneys, kind of guiding them through something, especially when it's their first time walking through this, especially when dealing with an elderly person. And what do you think your value is to any potential buyer or any potential seller? My value, I am, I guess I don't know how to, I- Well, uh, why would you hire you? One, I don't leave any money on the table. I don't have a problem saying no. <laughs> um, I also have, and I, I tell people this in listing appointments all the time. I will, um, I will always tell you the truth and I will tell you the truth as gracefully as I possibly can. And sometimes you might not like what the truth is, but I promise you, I will always tell you the truth and I will tell you what I would do myself if this were my house. And I do live by that. Like I, I when I'm working with buyers, I always feel good when I say like, I would buy this house in a heartbeat. You know, I would never leave you down a road that I wouldn't go down myself. So there's a trust established there and that value and the track record, you know, comes into place by, uh, you know, experience and so forth. But the value is honesty, um, expertise, uh, you know, guidance, compassion. There's, there's so many things that create that value. That's not just, I'm going to get you the highest price for your house. Because a lot of people can get that same number, but there's other pieces of value along the way. So one of the things that I consistently talk to you about on our, our weekly calls is you trying to do too much. Hmm. And, you know, because you're that kind of person who wants to get, wants to make sure everything is done and everything is done in the way you want it done. How, do you, a, a, does that resonate with you in terms of what you're trying to do? Absolutely. Cause you know, I think it takes everybody a long time to transition out of, you do it all on your own for so long. And whether you're adding an assistant or a buyer's agent, there is a, a let go period to know that they're going to do it just as good as you and hopefully better. Um, so it is tricky. It's also hard to find good people sometimes. And we're trying, we always try new things. You know, when we were in a growth period a couple of years ago, um, my sales took a hit because I was so focused on growing the business. I had to hire and fire people. And so, um, but trying to do everything uh, is does not lead to success, it leads to burnout. There's no question about that. Um, but finding the ways not to do everything is also challenging just as much as it's challenging to do a transaction. So you have to find that nice balance and not beat yourself up for taking a little time away from 
your actual real estate business to develop your business. I remember a few weeks back, you, you're in your driving van, you know, you're either delivering furniture or picking furniture up. And I'm, you know, I'm asking you, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And what I was doing is I was driving a 20 foot U-Haul down the 405 freeway on a Zoom call with you, completely illegal, going to de-stage a um, condo we had sold and taking my staging stuff back to our storage unit and me physically moving the couches. Um, absolutely not the best use of my time. My brain was thinking two thoughts. One, I want my teammates to see that I put in just as much elbow grease as they do. And that really, I think, pays off sometimes when it comes to management. And two, that I can Tetris the storage space better than anybody else. So I have to be there to do that, which is absurd. And that's why, Steve, I have you to, you know, call me out on my absurd thoughts and help me <laughs> let go. So shifting gears a little bit, do you, what would you say your approach is to social media? Is it something that you do consistently, inconsistently, you're interested in, not interested in, where do you stand on social media? So at the beginning of the year, um, we, we made a commitment that we would start doing videos on Instagram, which then switches over to Facebook automatically. So um, we do very short videos on a regular basis. And we kind of have like a pattern now that we're following with our posts of, you know, picture, house, video, picture, house, video, et cetera. Um, do I like doing it? Absolutely not. Uh, do I want to do it? Absolutely not. Am I doing it? Yes. Um, the reaction is always positive. Um, it keeps people engaged. It, it's just part, it's almost like, you know, you have to have a website, you know, 10 years ago to have a business today, you have to have a social media account. Um, it's not necessarily targeted at my demographic and my, um, targeted market, but with my peers and my, you know, friends through my child and, you know, high school friends and things like that, they are very interactive with that um, posting and it keeps them up to date on what we're doing. And so I think it's a very valuable component. It's a very inexpensive component. And I think that it's just as valuable as any other source of marketing. And unlike with most of my clients, I do encourage you, I want you on video all the time. And I, you know, I even suggested you have a full-time person ride around with you and document everything that you do. Where are you with that? What, what's your thought process around that? So I, I did hire somebody um, for the entire quarter. So our contract um, will be renewed at the end of May um, or I guess, anyways, um, it was a quarterly basis. Anyway, so he, we film once a week for six hours. It's a little bit more scripted probably than you want because yes, um, the candid stuff is fun, but then there's a lot of like paperwork and, you know, getting compliance sheets signed off on. Um, and so we're trying to take those candid moments that I see during the day and put them into entertaining sort of video clips. Um, versus just, you know, following me around all day, because sometimes it's just not that interesting. <laughs> and how do you see your business evolving over time? What, what are you thinking about next? And ultimately, what type of business do you want to have? So we're, we're a boutique business with a lot of great referral sources um, around the country. Um, I have traveled quite extensively to other places where I know people are going to, to retire, um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Florida, Arizona, um, Oregon to put partnerships in place. So we've got a great referral source. However, here locally, um, we want to keep a small shop operational because we're very focused on the relationship side of the business and, where I see us going with it is, you know, I have two main goals and that is really to shift the perception of 
consumers to understand, just like with attorneys, if, if you're getting a divorce, you don't hire a PI attorney, you hire a divorce attorney. You're both attorneys, but you specialize in different things. Um, I'd like people to know what a senior real estate specialist is, to understand how they bring different resources to the table. Um, and I think that that's something nationwide that would be wonderful if we could kind of impact the awareness of that. And number two, the other branch of the business that I will develop, which isn't necessarily, it is related to sales of real estate, but developing homes that are ADA accessible. Um, just a little tidbit about me. I have a sister that was paralyzed from the neck down when she was 23. So I've modified my entire home. I know how to um, build a house for someone that's in a wheelchair, but it's not necessarily a house that someone in a wheelchair, it's maybe someone who has, you know, really bad arthritis when they're 85 and they can't open their window because the crank is too difficult for them or the, the, you know, the, even just the faucets are in the wrong place. And there's all these fun things that we can do and make it look beautiful. So people aren't faced with their disabilities and they can really enjoy their home as they age in place. So that's the other arm of the business that we'll start um, really cultivating in the next couple of years. One of the conversations that you and I have regularly is around price point and raising your price point. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts around price and raising your price point? How, how do you see that happening? So I think it's kind of an organic um, process. When I first got into the business, my deals were, you know, lower every year they seem to increase. And then you start to really get strategic because you're so aware that you do the same amount of work for a condo that's $500,000 that you do for a home that's $10 million. So then you start to think, I want to focus on farming this area where the homes are all $10 million versus this area where the homes are all a million dollars. So the strategy behind that um, definitely helps. It's a mindset piece though, too. I think with COVID, we've all experienced different shifts in our beliefs about our value, about where we want our lives to go. And during COVID, I became absolutely aware that I'm a 6% agent, given the amount of work and effort we put into our deals. We don't necessarily like always get it, but we have turned down deals um, going since COVID that we won't take unless we get 6%. No one's had an issue with that. Um, but it's, it's a true mindset of knowing your value. And that's the same thing I think with the price point, I'm not afraid. And so I have a $52 million listing coming up um, next month. I currently have an $18 million listing that we'll bring to market tomorrow, actually. Um, I sold an $18 million house last year. That had never happened before. Like my kind of ceiling was probably 5 million. But once again, it went back to relationships cultivating them. The $52 million listing has been an eight year relationship ongoing to finally get to the seller, the seller to the place where he's comfortable selling this property. Um, and so, I, but I do believe you have to feel that you are qualified and that you are capable of selling uh, at a certain price point. Um, and once you feel that way, it, anything is possible. The last thing I want to touch on again, ongoing in our coaching is you taking care of yourself. You know, what is your view about self-care? Where do you struggle? Where do you excel? So I absolutely try to meditate for a little piece of the day every day. Um, sometimes I'm on a really great streak. Sometimes I'm not. Um, I'm always constantly looking though to um, realize I am just this tiny, tiny little speck in the grand scheme of things and that I have no control over anything. And that, you know, there's very few things I do have control over. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, you all just live in my world and, and you're supposed to do what I say. Um, so the self-care piece though comes into um, reminding myself of those things that I'm just here on this earth to be of service and my, my problems are not that important. And I feel really calm in that regard and it's all gonna take it care of itself. Um, but I have started two things I did this year. I put on my voicemail that if you call me after 6 p.m., your phone call will be returned the following day. I have a five-year-old daughter and I don't wanna miss these precious moments of her childhood with you know picking up the phone at six o'clock and you know in the middle of dinner. 
um, as well as trying to pick one day a week that I'm not working. It makes a huge difference. Um, it's really hard right now with COVID because there's so much business that, you know, we're running around with our buyers, we're getting our listings done, we're dealing with multiple offers. So it's really hard to draw that line, but it's imperative. Um, you know, it's a work in progress, I think, for all of us. What would be one piece of advice that you would share with the group in terms of something they need to be thinking about as they move forward in their business? I would say um, the best thing you can do to really enjoy your business and to differentiate yourself from the thousands of other realtors that are out there is to ask yourself what you're really passionate about outside of real estate or somehow maybe it blends into real estate. Um, you know, and then when you identify that, kind of really try to structure your business plan around doing those things that you really enjoy. Um, whether you're a lawn bowler or you love community service or your, your kids. I find that because I was very clear and I was very lucky that from the beginning, my passion has been protecting elders, that that just made everything very clear to me and how to structure my business. And it made it very enjoyable. So I never feel like I'm working. Even when my clients drive me crazy, I know that I'm serving them for a greater cause. Like we're doing this because we're getting you a single level house. I know this is hard. You're driving me crazy. But the end result is something that's going to benefit you for the rest of your life. So I think that if you know what you're passionate about, whether it's animals and you go and volunteer at the animal shelter or you start a golden retriever club with your neighbors, that really can help make everything just fall into place the way it's supposed to. Allison, thank you very much for being with us this evening. We appreciate your wisdom and generosity. Thank you again. Everybody have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Good heart.